And then we now have a stimulus bill which offers federal loan guarantees to ensure um, money is available for renewables to be built. We have system planning going on at the Department of Energy level. This is the federal level. In 2007, 2008, they put out a report called 20% Wind Energy by 2030. There was also the Joint Coordinated System Plan that came out the February after that, in 2009, and then most recently released the Inter Eastern Interconnection Planning Collaborative that was most re released within the last, um, I believe it was January. All of these plans are built on wind energy being built. They, the 20% wind energy by 2030 is a, it's they say it's not a feasibility study, but it's an attempt to look at what, how can we get to 20% of the United States consumption of available electricity coming from wind. The Eastern Interconnection Planning Collaborative and the Joint Coordinated System Plan are both plans that talk about how do we get wind to the East Coast that is, a, is generated west of here, okay? Now, I want to talk about some of those. Now, what, I said that the, uh, the idea of those plans is it's all about wind. The bottom line is the federal government has picked a winner. It's picked a favorite child. It has picked wind. That's what it's decided through DOE and all of the agencies that are involved in energy. Wind is the preferred. And I'll talk a little bit about that and, and the risks associated with that. Okay, the DOE's 20% wind energy by 2030 is an amazing document. It says that we will install, to get to that point, we have to install 305,000 megawatts of wind between now and 2030. And does anyone know how much wind is installed in the United States today? It's about one, it's a little over 1%, 35,000 megawatts of wind is installed today. We have to get to, and, and last year was a banner year, 2009, it's a banner year, they put in about 10,000 megawatts. Prior to that, it was 8,000 megawatts, that was the banner year. Prior to that, very little. In 2000, the end of 2006, there was 11,000 megawatts of wind. So you see there's a very accelerated rate, rate of development. but. Not so fast that we could get to 305,000 megawatts within, um, by 2030. The other aspect is that should scare the heck out of any one of you in this room. You see those green lines there? 19,000 miles of new 765 kV transmission line. We don't have 765 kV transmission line in New England. But you've all probably seen photos of it. They're out west. They stand 200 feet tall. They're the biggest things you've ever seen when it comes to transmission lines. 19,000 miles of new 765 kV line has to be built in order to support the delivery of 305,000 megawatts of wind. Bottom line is, you see the, green, the, the purple and yellow? The federal government envisions transforming the midsection of this country from North Dakota down to Texas, from Utah to Ohio, into a gigantic wind energy facility. We're not talking about 17 turbines here. We're not talking about 12 in Lemster. We're not talking about 33 in Cross County, New Hampshire. We're talking thousands. And wherever you're not seeing a turbine, you're seeing a transmission line. And it's all put in place, the plan, so that we can service our coastal properties. Where's the load? The load is not in North Dakota. Our load is on the East Coast, it's on the West Coast, and then it's in our cities in, in the midsection. So with that policy in place, I promise I'm gonna to get to Vermont in a second, you would go down to the next, okay, next one more slide. If you look at, well, I don't know if you, the, the interconnection queue, if you, what happens is whenever someone wants to build an energy project, a power plant, 
in New in anywhere in the United States, they have to file their request with the entity that manages the grid for where they are. Here in New England, you would file it with the ISO New England. The ISO New England manages the grid. In New York, you'd file it with New York ISO. In the mid, mid Atlantic states, out to parts of Illinois, you'd file it with PJM. That's the name of the grid operator. Texas is an entity of its own, you file it with Burkhardt. If you look at all of those, and you look at all the new, newly proposed projects, as of, what's the date on that? I have the next one. I think it's, um, okay, February. no, that's today. It's, it is February 2009. As of February 2009, 90% of all the renewable energy projects that are proposed in the country were wind projects. 90% of them. Now, it's said that, wind, that, that the United States, the federal policy has is, is picked a favorite. But so have the developers. Why do you think they want to build wind? <coughs> Don't talk about the subsidies. We'll talk about that. Now, that's not why a developer is going to develop wind. Why does the developer want to build wind? It is related to the subsidies. You can build a wind project, 100 megawatt wind project, from six, in six months to a year. You can get it up and running. And you get the same subsidies that you basically that you would get if you were building a more uh, a biomass facility. Biomass, on the, however, produces 24/7. I know I can control biomass. I can I know that I can make it generate when I need it. That's not the case with wind. Why is that? Why can't you control the energy coming out of wind? Unpredictability. Right. You can't, you can't throw money at the wind to make it blow, right? So you kind of get the whim of the wind. So the developers are really interested in building the cheapest that they can build, as quick as they can build, so they can start profiting as quickly as they can. If you had a choice between building a really nice car, a lot of manufacturing to make it with all the really nice parts, expensive to build, or a Kia, or some low-end car, and you were going to get the, you were going to put them on the market, and all you could do is sell them for the same amount. Which one are you going to build? When you build the cheaper, it's economics, right? You build the cheapest you can to reap the most benefit for yourself, and that's really what it is. Wind is a low value generator for us, quick and dirty to build, and reaps the same high subsidies. We'll talk about that too. In a I'll just, we can skip this slide. It's just talking about the amount of electricity that's going to come from the Midwest. Okay, so summarizing the 20% wind by 2030, 305,000 megawatts of installed wind, geographically distributed, so we have to put it all over the place to make sure at some point the wind is blowing somewhere. 19,000 miles of new 765 KV lines. This number is actually higher these days based on the newer study, but I'm using the, the older studies, the, the one from 2008. $60 billion in transmission and infrastructure costs. That number has now been upgraded, updated to closer to $100 billion. But I'll tell you, that's not even covering the surface. A couple of years ago, I sat on a panel with um, um, Michael O'Sullivan. He is a... a Executive VP at FPL Energy, which is one of the, largest, the largest American wind developer here in the United States. And he sat down, and he privately turned to me and he said, no one's going to support 20% wind in this country. As soon as the American people find out that it's not going to be 50 billion, at that time they were throwing around the 50 to 60 billion dollar. It's not going to be $100 billion. Try $250 billion in transmission costs, never mind the cost of building the projects themselves. Wind power development capital costs, we're picking up the cost on that. The American public, through the subsidies, is picking up a chunk of the cost of development on those projects. And then high profit opportunity. So there's one important quote I need to read to you from this report that I don't have on the slide. 